So anyway, uh, on like in the beginning of season five, there's a, an episode called Darmok, uh, which is where I'm at right now. I'm at like episode four, and this is like episode two. And apparently, what, like the premise of the episode is. Uh, the Enterprise encounters a group of aliens called the Temerians who, over the past 100 years, the Enterprise or uh, <clears throat> the Federation has encountered like seven times. But everyone who's encountered them has deemed them like, we, we don't know how to talk to them. Like, we've tried. Both, of, both sides have tried to talk to each other, and we just we can't get messages across. We don't, get, we don't understand each other at all. And so uh, while they're sitting there trying to communicate again, uh, John Luke Picard and the captain of the Temerians gets beamed down forcibly to the the, the planet's surface, <clears throat> and uh, they say uh, and the, they keep saying Darmok and Jalad at Tinagra, uh, and like you can see the Temerians are like arguing about that and they don't understand like they're trying to figure out what happens. And then suddenly Picard and the captain get beamed down to the surface and the Temerians are shooting a particle beam or something into the atmosphere so they can't beam them out and they can't set rescue or anything like that. And so Picard and the other captain are down there and they're, they're trying to figure each other out uh, and they end up like having to fight with each other to defeat this like beast that's on the, the planet that they're on. The other captain ends up dying. But in the process, uh, Captain Picard realizes that the way that they communicate is they use metaphor, uh, so they don't say exactly what they're feeling. They say, like, they, re- they reference mythology and stories. And so, like, Darmok and Jalad were uh, a hunter and a warrior who got trapped on an island together and became friends because they had to defeat a beast that was on the island. Hmm. And so, like, <clears throat> once the uh, everything is kind of said and done, the, the other captain is dead, the Enterprise is about to start firing on uh, the, the other ship, the Temerian ship and whatnot, Captain Picard finally gets back to the bridge. He's, they open up a channel, and through metaphor, because like slowly over, like he was able to use, he was able to figure out certain uh, metaphor. Like uh, it was timber with arms wide open means um, give or like you want. He, like he's ex- he's accepting stuff, and so th- using that phrase, he was able to get a little bit more of what Darmok and Jalad was, and all this stuff, and he figured out what the kind of story was, and so he used the stories that he learned from the captain while he was dying to relate how he felt about the Temerians and that captain hmm. to the rest of the Temerians on the ship using those phrases. And so, like, the the big thing was Darmok and Jalad at Tinagra means that two people became friends through hardship. Hmm. And so they, they by saying that to them, they understood, oh, we're peaceful now. Like, we get each other now, sort of. Right. So Darmok and Jalad at Tinagra. Sorry, also, that, that, like, flew, like... Right over you here. You weren't like, listening. That entire thing. You weren't listening I at all. I do not like Star Trek at all, bro. Are you into Star Trek? <clears throat> no. Don't get into it. But I understand. What I understand from Star Trek is that they're always getting caught on planets. Like, that's like... The original uh, series was that well, way. They're like explorers, right? That's like their mission. Yeah, the original series was definitely that way. And I haven't I haven't watched any, really, of the original series. I started, I was like, I grew up with next gen being on and so i was like you know i i need to sit here and like this is a major pop culture thing that a lot of people relate to so i want to go and see what this is about and i will admit like the first three seasons a little hard to watch like the first season especially is kind of hard to watch but um they start to pick up in the second season a lot more and then you start to uh get a little bit more attached to the characters in the third season and the fourth season was just like a string of these amazing episodes. Mm. Like, just episode after episode. I was like, holy shit, these are great. I couldn't stop watching it. And then now, now I'm in the fifth season. There's a lot of fucking episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. I don't know. I'm, I enjoyed the the rebooted movie. The yeah. first one. The second one. Meh. I liked them both. I, I agree the first one was better than the second one. Mm. But we already know that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, like there was another one too. Uh, I actually have a couple things that I want to film with you based off of Star Trek shit. Oh, okay. Yeah, there was two episodes in a row that were just so fucking amazing. The first one uh, was called The Devil's Do. I don't remember what the episode number is, but it's like 13 in, in uh, this, the fourth season. And the, basically the premise is uh, there, what appears to be a devil-like figure of this culture uh, shows up right as all these things are happening uh, and is saying that oh I'm I'm the devil that was listed in this religious contract that you guys that like formed peace amongst your society a thousand years ago 
and this contract is up now. The thousand years have passed. I want you, I'm now here to enslave you all and whatnot. Hmm. <clears throat> and Picard's like, I, I don't believe in that. And so uh, he he's he was there because they had science officers and stuff on the on the planet, and they they had a uh, they called for a rescue, so he came there to to save his people. And then in the the whole midst of that, he got introduced to this devil character. Uh, and he's like, mm, I'm pretty sure that this devil character is a con artist. And so we just need to figure out how to prove it. And so they, uh, through a bunch of different little things, they slowly figure out that, yeah, this is the, the con artist. This is how they're doing it. It was kind of like a, uh, a Penn and Teller thing where they're like, uh, or James Randi or, or even, um, uh, Houdini, where it's like, no, that's not how that works. I, I can do that same trick, and it's really easy. Like, if you understand what you're doing, it's really easy to fool someone. Right. And so they, they go through this whole trial thing, and uh, uh, finally at the very end, they get the evidence they need to be like, oh, no, she's a car artist. Here's how. Like, hey, look, I can do this shit, too. And they finally start doing it. Hey, hi, hello. What are you up to this? This is the Aloha Broha podcast. I am one of your hosts, John Cozy, and with me, as always, is Science Ben. What's up? Minus Sheiks. Because I forgot to tell her we were recording today. She's going to be so pissed at you. I I kind of just told her that I tried to text you, but then in reality, I didn't text her. <laughs> but then she's going to, hopefully she doesn't listen to this. So oh, man. this is between us, guys. You're going to get like your face ripped off, man. <laughs> well, that's today. First time ever on the podcast, we got my homie Sterling Higa. What's hello, up, man? Hello, hello. How you doing? I'm good. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, I've seen this place on the internet, on and it. now I'm in it. It's yeah, like stepping yeah. into a picture. <laughs> nice. <laughs> on the YouTube, but unfortunately, I didn't bring the GoPro today. I don't so know, man. Not game. not too much people watch it on the YouTube, so I figure. Yeah, that's what man. I was saying. Like, uh, I figured if we do video at all, we'll just do like little highlight things. Like, if something, we'll, we'll keep videoing them, but then I'll eventually I'll download that the stuff from you, the the Adobe Premiere. Yeah. yeah. And I'll start doing the editing, and then we'll just I'll, like if there's nothing exciting happens that we need to visually see, we'll just won't put up an episode or we won't put up a, a video. But if something funny visually happens, then you know we'll I'll chop it up and we'll throw it up in there. I, don't, I can't watch a long form like <clears throat> medium visually when yeah, it's I, just like one you know it's like one a one shot. Yeah, and it's just people hanging around talking. I don't know. Some people are visual like that. I guess I, I kind of like. Put well, it, I, I feel put like it up in the background of my yeah. screen, and then yeah. I, I watch slash listen. While yeah, I was gonna I say. I feel like things. most people like put it up, and then they like, they're doing they're other doing stuff. And then if something happens that they need to see it, they'll like back it up or just start watching and be like, "Oh, now I see what they're talking about." <laughs> yeah, maybe. So, so, so it's not like we throw up graphics or anything. Yeah. I mean. We don't like show like oh yeah go to this website and then we put up the link to the web. I mean we don't do any of that stuff. Eventually, when we get more popular, we should like hire. When we somebody. get a tricaster, that'd be kind of tight. Yeah. That'd be fun. Sorry, you've been rapping, man. I've been rapping. Yeah, you I've be had, rapping. I've uh got a. It's it's a rap song, but it's a pop song. It's a single coming out tomorrow. Tomorrow, which is Monday, uh-huh. the first of February. Nice. And. I'm in the studio right now with a uh, good friend, Chris Salvador, working on a, it's like R&B with some rapping on it. To be singing too. Uh, no, Chris Salvador yeah. is singing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fortunately for the world, I'm not singing. A lot of rappers be singing nowadays, man, ever since they found out about auto-tune. Yeah. <laughs> I, even even with auto, I think. Does that really count as singing, <laughs> I guess. I mean. Yeah, are they, what, like, are they are they all they like ultra auto tuned now? Or is it all like well, the is, they're singing, but they're singing out of tune, and the auto tune comes in to make it in tune, right? But I'm saying, and then but I'm just saying, crank like, it up so that it makes it go like, that that shit, right? But I'm yeah. saying like the point of auto tune was like so that you're not supposed to know that it's auto tuned. It was just supposed to make minor corrections it's for minor someone, corrections. Yeah, someone right. wasn't yeah. Quite but then they perfect. just like turn it up to like eleven, yeah, or twelve because it sounds weird. <laughs> Sounds like T Pain. Exactly. But the but funny T Pain can sing. Yo, he's he can sing. So good. Live. The, the, the tiny desk session. The you tiny see that? desk. It's my favorite. I go yeah. back and watch it sometimes. He just did it for an effect, I guess. I don't know. I I, I give T Pain a pass <clears throat> for that because Bartender is my favorite song of all time. Well, yeah. I mean, like mm. he he was using it as an effect, not like to cover the fact that he couldn't sing. Like right. he he was doing something new with it, and then everyone else kind of was copying t-pain instead of doing their own thing with auto tune yeah i think i don't really know i'm just kind of talking out of my ass on that but i mean 
That's what it seems like. I definitely agree, though, that there are some people singing air quotes on that who shouldn't be singing, and it's probably Autotune's fault. Mm. So you're telling me if I got Autotune, I could be a singer because I'm oh, like okay. horrible at singing. I have Autotune. I'm not to use it. So if you ever wanted to do an Autotune well, song, well, on our on our Two Fat Fucks <laughs> album, we're gonna do that, <laughs> and we're gonna make me sound amazing. Oh yeah, me and Ben are in a rap group. Yeah, we're called a, Two Fat Fucks. It's a comedy rap group. So she's a comedian or a failed comedian or whatever, and I rap. <laughs> I actually would like to see a comedy slash rap album. Yeah. Like Mitch Hedberg, but with raps. Imagine if Mitch Hedberg rapped, dude. <laughs> That'd be crazy. <laughs> I was just listening to his album the other day, dude. Two of his albums, fucking classic, man. Yeah. Just those one-liners or whatever yeah, the fuck golden, you call them. Yeah. You know, man, like, and that's hard to do. That type of comedy is super hard. Yeah. One-liner comedy. My middle schoolers don't like it. I, I gave We were talking about jokes the other day in class, yeah. and... They asked me, Mr. Sterling, tell a joke. I was like, the dog is forever in the push-up position. And they were like, what? <laughs> and I was like, don't you get it? Yeah. And it took them like oh, a minute to get there. Fantastic. And then they got there and they were like, that's not that funny, Mr. Sterling. And I was like, damn, you just don't appreciate it. <laughs> next time next time they do it, you should be like, uh, uh, there should never be a... a Ele- or uh, uh, escalator out of order sign. It should only be escalator temporarily stairs. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, man, what's your favorite Mitch Hedberg joke? I like his uh, receipt for a donut joke. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm trying to remember exactly how it goes, but he's like, uh, I went to the store and I bought a donut, and then the guy tried to give me a receipt for a donut. And I was like, why are you giving me a receipt for a donut? I give you money, you give me a donut. End of transaction. I can't think of a time when I'll ever have to prove that I bought a donut. Yeah. <laughs> I like the banana one, man. My friend offered me a frozen banana, and I said no, but I want a regular banana later, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, <clears throat> I think uh, it's uh, my favorite is, I used to do drugs. I, I still, still do, do, but I used to, too. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, funny, they're so dude. great, and like you can hear them over and over again. It's still funny. Like I was, I heard, I listened to those <clears throat> albums like five times before already. And the other day, I was in my car, like I'd gotten home and I'd left the car running and just sat in the car and listened to the albums, and I was still laughing out loud. Oh yeah, man, it, like fuck. It's one of the nice, like one of the things about comedy is it. It's hard to be repeatable. Like it's hard to have those jokes that happen. And you listen to them again and again. That's why so many artists, uh, so many comedians are very coveting about like when they get filmed and when they get they hear their jokes. They don't just tell them in anyone. Yeah. Uh, because it's you don't often hear like uh, like you do at like a, a band's playing or whatnot, where like if the set's going bad, then they can just go play their old stuff and everyone loves it again. Right. And, like you, the, if someone hears a joke, usually if they hear it again, they're like, "We've heard that one." They don't want to hear it again. But like Mitch Hedberg fired him off at like. Such a clip. There's just so many on each album. Yeah. And they're all such high quality yeah. that, like, I feel like most of them don't stick. And so you're able to listen to that album over and over and over again and <laughs> still appreciate every single one. Word, man. Word. It's incredible. Yeah. So back to our guest, man. Where are you from, Mr. Sterling Higa? I'm from downtown Honolulu, Hawaii. Bar- Specifically the new uanu valley the lower part which is not the super bougie part the super bougie it's only part. like the semi bougie part okay yeah born and raised you born and raised yeah I was, I was born and raised uh i lived in new uanu all my life uh except my mom and i just moved earlier this year a few months ago to near the university which oh. is different oh, i see it's a lot hotter mm. but it's still good Hotter, like, like muggier, or... It's not more humid. It's just, there's less, I think, wind most of the uh, time, okay. so... And it doesn't rain as often. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of like what it... Well, it, it's kind of like, it, like the opposite thing kind of happened to me, because, like, I grew up mostly in Kapolei Makakilo, where it was, like, never raining, but super windy. Mm. Then I moved here, and it was, like, raining Milanians, raining all the time, and not that windy. Yeah. And so it's just like there was, especially during the summer, there's just these like waves of fucking mugginess and just so Ugh. human. And you're just like, eh. mm. you have to have fans on everywhere. <laughs> so, so growing up, man, was like music was hit, music a big influence on you? 
She she trying right now? Not really. Or well, <laughs> where does it start for you? Actually, like your creativity was it? Because I know you're a. Yeah. Uh, I was gonna say stand up, but you're a slam poet, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So was it? Were you a rapper before or after you're a slam poet? Which came first? I guess I was like 17. I was a junior in high school when I started listening to hip hop, uh-huh. and my friends were into like underground hip hop, like Nujabes and. Uh, Oh, all man. kinds of underground stuff, dilated peoples. Did you go to Shingo 2 concert last night? I did go last night. I was I missed out. It was fantastic. Yeah, this band is like a new job, this tribute. Yeah, that, Shingo 2. It start, I'm sorry that it started late. That started late because of our of you. comedy show. <laughs> oh, that was you. <laughs> yeah, that was our yeah. comedy show. That was our, our, our show ended up running a little bit long. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, no, we we were apologizing profusely to Bone and Bruh. and how long Shingo did he, how late did he run? Uh, we he got off stage at about nine twenty nine twenty five. Yeah, I think so. the doors open maybe like forty five minutes late. But yeah, the the doors were supposed to open at nine, <clears throat> but just <laughs> things just didn't work out. Is there a fat line or something? Yeah. Oh. Like the line when I was closing my door because basically Jay Larson had, had actually gone on. And so I was like, well, at this point, if anyone wants to walk in, we're not going to, like, really push on them to pay or anything like that. No one walked in. Everyone at Shingo, like, that was the thing, too, is, like, I offered a whole bunch of people at Shingo, too. It was like, hey, you know, the like, their their door actually doesn't open until 9-ish. And so we're, we're, but we have a comedy show on right now. If you guys want to come in, I'm, I won't pay you. And they're all like, okay, sure. And then they all just stood there outside. And it was really weird. They didn't want to go see a comedy show. No, yeah. It was like, okay, well, I mean, you could have been laughing and while you were waiting, but well, instead... They were, they were also standing in line, and the people were like, you know, you don't need to stand in line. Like, everyone's going to get in. You could just go play yeah. darts or something. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go play darts. Yeah. It was it was a very odd group, but... They like lines. I think a lot of people like to stand in they the line. They want to be in queue. I fucking hate lines, man. I wonder what that is. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, yeah, it was it was really weird and odd, but I mean, both shows were really good. Well, my favorite part actually about last night was um when we showed up to to set up our green room for the comedians and whatnot. Uh, Chingo and whatnot were were um, sound checking, and so like we got to sit there through a couple songs, uh, just like just us and the sound guys. And we're like, yeah, I this is went. the shit. I wish I went last night. I was incapacitated last night. Ah, that sucks. I did drugs. Yeah, <laughs> Yo, really bro, guess. they have some crazy new shit. It's like these pills that they they press them, <laughs> but there's like a break line in them now. So they tell you to only take half. But I was like, nah, I got this. Yeah, we're going to take the whole I thing. Took the whole thing. And I was just... It's probably what I would I do, I think too. I pretty much like fried my brain, maybe. Wait, drug dealers are now putting like pills that you can break in half? Apparently. Are these yeah. drug dealers like well, pharmaceutical I mean, <clears throat> companies? I mean, I remember a few years ago... <laughs> I remember a few years ago. It's a precaution because they're really strong. You know, you ever try MDMA? No. It's just, you know, well, yeah. It's a hell of a but drug. But I'm I'm very glad though that they're getting their dosing like on point because I sort remember of. back <laughs> kind of <laughs> sort of. Back- well, the the thing about it was like I remember a couple years ago there was this one pill uh, called uh, a white skull candy and it was a pretty fat looking pill and at the time dealers were saying cut this into quarters and eat it. Uh, and I was just at the, also at the time. Like, I've had a high tolerance for ever. Like from the very first time that I've taken stuff, I had to take more than what people recommend taking. And so, like, I was just like, I'm just gonna take this whole thing. And I took that, and I was like, Wow, this thing is really strong. <laughs> and so, uh, I think that I, I don't know what it is about it, but that there's definitely uh, well, uh, you know, it might be part of the Zanny, the the Xanax culture, where the the thing comes in bars, and you're supposed to be breaking it in mm. force to take it anyway. And so people are like. Uh, it might be a, a, a bit of a, a thing where it's like, oh, if it seems like they're not supposed to be taking the whole thing, the people will be willing to pay more for it or shit like that or something. Or something that does anything, but apparently people are, like Winslow, last last episode, he's saying it helps his creative process, I guess. Yeah, I don't <laughs> yeah, know. I don't, know, I don't understand Zanny's either. I don't get so. it. Maybe I have to do some experimenting. Anyway. New job is, who else were your influence? You like that feel good vibe, like hip hop shit? I did. Uh... I, then I got mm-hmm. into Blue Scholars really heavy. Oh, yeah. Um, and I was listening to Macklemore back in 2009. Before like, he didn't blow right, up. A, right about the time when uh, Other Side came out. Oh, okay. And then he started to get like a lot of buzz. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I was really into the whole Portland scene. So Sand People Crew 
was like a really early yeah. in inspiration. Sapient was like my favorite rapper for a good year. I listened to everything that he put out. Mm. Um, honestly, I wanted to be him. Honestly, your story reminds me a lot of one of my favorite rappers slash slam poets, which is uh, Watsky. You know, it's funny. I actually know Watsky. Uh, nice. We hung out last summer at a poetry festival, Brave New Voices, which is what he came out of. And also I went in 2010, which is where I met him for the first time. And I was in one of his workshops and he was talking about I, I don't even remember, but I remember looking at this guy and being like, man, he's so cool. Like, he's going to go and do great mm. things. And yeah. then he blew up. Like, he just, like, blew up and he was doing tours all around the country. And he blew up for one of the craziest reasons, too. Uh, like, a big push to why he got a bunch of fame was the fact that he turned down T-Mobile. for huh. Like, T-Mobile came to him and was like, we're going to give you a million dollars to to do uh, a talk fast ad. Right. And he's like... Okay, no, don't, I, that's not really like how I feel about this whole situation. Right. So I'm just gonna keep doing my thing, and then like that kind of got him press. And it was also the like he also got a, a big press about uh, the Pale Kid Raps Fast video right. too. And so like that like because that's what got him the Team Mobile offer. And then the <laughs> fact that he was like fuck the system and like kept doing his own thing, yeah, and putting out his own work, turning down like a million dollars. Uh, was really kind of rocketed him really fast. Just smart decision too, because you don't want to be that T-Mobile commercial rapper guy. Yeah. For the rest of your career. Yeah, exactly. Especially like I mean, I I, I feel like he's good enough that he could have used that money and created these incredible things with it. But at the same time, like I I completely understand the sentiment of like, oh, I I just don't want to have that over my head at all. Right. Yeah. Mm. It's interesting things. Yeah, I don't know how much I would sell out for. I'm trying to think how much Marvel does T, how much money does T-Mobile have really? Fuck tons. I don't know, man. Billions. Hmm. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Like, there's very few things that I wouldn't do for a million dollars because I could use that capital to like, f- like really, uh, just completely fund future ventures into things. Like sucking a dick, right? Oh fuck yeah, I'd suck a dick yeah. for a million dollars. Are you kidding me? I'd suck a dick for a few <laughs> thousand dollars. A few thousand. Yeah. That's all it takes. Like, you, 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 like <laughs> you give me enough to get rid of my debt? Yeah, I'll suck a dick. I don't even give a yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. Not not even embarrassed about uh, that at all. If I could be debt free and all I had to do was take a shot <clears> in the mouth, <throat> fuck yeah, I would. So what made you want to, like, you listen to rap, and then what made you want to, like, do it yourself? Uh, I don't know. I always liked writing. Uh, I never really did it. I, I mostly read books and then... yeah. When I started writing bars, uh, I would rap for my coworker at this organic grocery store called Huckleberry Farms. Rest in peace is now closed. Is that uh, over here? It was, uh, it was in town uh, in the New Uwanu shopping plaza, right next to where Hungry Lion used to be. Uh, okay. Rest in peace. Uh, so many great places there are now gone, replaced by Walgreens. Uh, that was like my neighborhood right there. Uh, but I would be like, cleaning bananas and rapping to my coworker as I stock these organic bananas. Uh, and he was like, man, you're really good. And I was like, really? You think so? Uh, but I sucked. I was terrible. So I started recording these videos in my room. Uh, and fortunately, I don't think anyone downloaded them before I deleted them off the internet. I think I've seen a few of them. Yeah, but there are some old ones that are truly terrible, like 2010 stuff and it's just me rapping in front of a blank wall behind me like webcam videos yeah. uh, and they're bad but <laughs> the interesting thing about them was like i w- i think i've recorded like 200 of these videos oh wow yeah uh but <clears throat> part of doing that made me really well practiced in terms of getting takes because i'd try to do like a two or three minute song in one take right mm-hmm. uh which is I guess not how most people approach making music at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I could do a two-minute or three-minute take comfortably with rhythm now when I'm in the studio. Uh, but it all came from just, like, rapping. And I didn't really know there was a local hip-hop scene when I first started. Yeah. And I kind of, like, fell into the spoken word scene because my mom was like, oh, you're writing stuff. I always hear you rapping in your room. Because yeah, yeah. I would close the door and rap in my room, and I'd do my take ten times to get it right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and she's like, you should go to this writing workshop. And I was like, no, mom, I don't really want to go to this writing workshop because she found it in the newspaper. Uh, and then I, like, tripped while I was skating, and I think I sprained my ankle, and I couldn't do anything. 
I was really hoping you were going to be like, I tripped and I fell into this writing workshop. Well, all, that's basically <laughs> it. I, it really, like, so I sprained <clears throat> my ankle and I was like, oh, man, I can't skate. I can't surf. So I didn't go to the writing workshop. And then, like, a week later, I tripped while skating again and fractured my wrist. <gasps> Though at the time, I didn't know it was fractured. <clears throat> I thought it was sprained. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just sort of kept doing the things I was doing, but I couldn't do them. So I went to the writing workshop finally. And it was like a magical moment. The first writing workshop I went to, there were these two kids, Itai Wong and Alakai Kotris, in the workshop. And they wrote these poems in like 10 minutes and read them. And I was like, holy shit. And then it was my turn to read. And I read this terrible 16 bar verse. Mm. Uh, and they had these great elaborate poems. And I was like, wow, these kids are so cool. And I only found out like later on that they had just come back from winning their second con- second consecutive international like youth poetry slam oh, festival wow. title cuz Hawaii won two years in a row and i had no idea at the time but like my very first workshop was like their first workshop back from winning wow uh, that's crazy this title and i was like holy shit these kids are great they're like the best in the world but they literally were the best in the world <laughs> uh, yeah hawaii hawaii cats have been on like international slam poetry competitions for yeah, it's a lot, right? it's it's a really interesting thing because we have like a very small poetry community. It's very tight. Like I yeah. could probably tell you the names of everyone mm-hmm. yeah. in the community, uh, but they show out like they've uh, when they were going to the youth. They don't go to the youth competition anymore, but they made finals twice and won twice. They've made semifinals like every year after that, and then the adult national poetry team. Uh, we made semifinals in 2014, and then last year I was coaching the team, and we went all the way to final stage and placed second in the country. So, wow! There's a lot of talented poets here. Yeah, getting recognized on an international level too. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, the only thing about it is that we don't really have touring poets come out of Hawaii because it's impossible to tour. So we can like mm. show up to a competition yeah. like for five days and then mm-hmm. like wreck shop. But no one from Hawaii really is touring off poetry because you can barely break even. You know? Yeah. If, if you break even, you're lucky on yeah, a poetry it's, tour. It's, it's very similar to why we don't have a lot of various uh, creative acts coming to Hawaii is because the, the travel to and from oh, our position. I forgot to silence my phone. The travel coming to and from our position here in the, the middle of the ocean is expensive as hell. And it makes it very, very hard. To, to try and actually make money doing it. Like you said, it, it's you're very lucky if you break even doing these kind of things. Right. So it, it's quite ridiculous. Yeah, you kind of have to be, like, on already, <clears throat> like, some sort of, like, have some level of popularity before anybody from Hawaii could, like, embark on a tour. Well, even, cost I think that's the same. That's why there's not a lot of, like, touring hip-hop <clears throat> acts. Yeah, and, and even that, like, the, 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 the touring hip-hop acts out of Hawaii – gained their their notoriety because they were able to like go to the mainland and do a really cheap tour yeah like they basically like moved to the mainland for a little while and then did a little cheap tour around the their local area or the, the states around them and that yeah. was able to get them enough fame so that they can start doing bigger tours and whatnot yeah but like it's hard to just to get noticed out way out here in the middle of the ocean definitely even with the internet even with the internet because there's a lot of chaff out there that you got to wade through yeah I mean, you do it long enough, you're gonna get spotted. But right, it's that that's a especially out here with the the costs of just living here. That's it, it, um, now I'm forgetting the whole the words, but it's a it's a battle of a. <clears throat> also, the quality of the art, man. I feel like in Hawaii, there's no bar that said everybody just kind of like jerks each other off. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. It's that aloha spirit. I I definitely feel that when I first started getting into the hip hop scene here. I was very discouraged because, like, yeah. there were a lot of artists uh, I saw who I was just like, you're not good. And also, <laughs> like, it th- there's, like, <clears throat> it's okay to not be good at something if you're not offensive. But a lot of them were just, like, <clears throat> offensive. So, like, they'd be, like, the sort of pussy money weed trope but without any lyricism at all. Like, mm-hmm. just doing the same thing in the same repetitive ways. And I'd, I'd be going to the shows and being, like, trying to wait for the, the act that I came to see and go through, like, two openers and be like, man, this is, like, 
terrible, like truly, <laughs> truly terrible. And somebody told you that this was good. Like oh, yeah. one of your friends or your classmates was like, yeah, you should totally do this on a stage somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to tell people that they're not that good, man. I think it's because the community is so small that we see each other like, you know, like how you say you could probably name everybody in the poetry scene. I could probably name everybody in the hip hop scene. <laughs> You know, we yeah. have to like fake, you just see each other someday. You don't want to burn any bridges, I guess. Right. But still, well, I mean, that's to be like a standard, right? You know. Yeah, what I mean? and and that's that's something that's kind of uniquely Hawaii about the the various subcultures here. And I actually made a post on Sunday in the Hawaii comedians Facebook thing, uh, or not Sunday, fucking Friday. Yeah. But um, and the whole kind of point of it was like there was a bunch of bickering and infighting because a couple people didn't like a couple other people, sort of thing, uh, and. I have not been on stage in a while, and there's a bunch of new comics. So there's a bunch of new people in the comedy scene who don't really know who I am. Uh, and I'm not like I'm really someone to know, but like I've been in the background of comedy scene for about three and a half years doing the sound and audio. And I used to get up on stage. Now I'm more just like kind of work on a show here and there and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Uh, and before that, I was doing sound and lighting for the rave scene and whatnot. And so like I like I've been mentored by a bunch of like some really big names in the various scenes here. Yeah. Uh, and I've seen each of the scenes that grow and die a couple times. It seems. Oh yeah. There's like, yeah, it like goes in a cycle. <clears throat> yeah. For some it's, it's, you, yeah. And you can see it coming. Oh. And so like, I can see the comedy scene here, like about to take this huge fall and like a bunch of shows are going to disappear and all this stuff. And so I'm like, well, I just made this quick post where I'm like, Oh, none of you probably like only a few of you really know who I am. And I just kind of gave a quick backstory of, like, where I'm coming from when I said this. But I was like, look, the biggest problem that's facing the, the comedy scene right now is, like, all this infighting and bickering. Like, you don't have to like each other, but you can't let it affect business. Right. Like, if a promoter doesn't like uh, an artist, but the artist is uh, – or the comedian is worthy of being on the show, you can't just not book him because he's not uh, – because you don't like him. At the same time, if you're not getting booked – you can't just go and start a show just to fuck over this guy's show. <laughs> I laugh because the poetry scene in Hawaii was very much like that for a little bit. Really? Yeah, a few yeah, years like ago. I guess every scene is like that. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> I'm finding it to be a very yeah. Hawaii thing where it's like they'll hold a grudge and then they'll try and compete with each other when we right. don't have a market that's big enough to be competitive. Like right. We all need to work together to get to a point where we'll be competitive right but like right now if there's any competition the scene's just gonna fall apart right which it's a really interesting thing because like very often like the quality of shows here the production quality of shows is low right very low and so the response of people is to go and start a new venue where the production quality is even lower because they don't know how to run a show yeah Yeah. most people who like start a show out of revenge like have no idea (laughs) how to handle a show yeah. And then it just sort of drives it down because attendance at the first show lowers and then that show has to yeah. cut back and Yeah, it's it's not like we have a giant pool that we can we can carve our little bit out of right. to make stuff. It's like we all we all need to be kind of living off the same pool here. And if we if we're not helping each other, we're only hurting each other. Right. And you can't screw with the audience <clears throat> that way too. No. Like if the audience comes to any comedy show and it's like lame, right? Yeah. If then, they go to any then, show, they're gonna not coming up, not go to any more shows like that if they right. don't, if it's not done right. Mm. So, and the, the comedy is a particularly weird one because one of the the vital parts of comedy is the open mics, mm. and open mics are not supposed to be good. They're supposed to be where where a comedian goes and like tries out new stuff, and so it's supposed to be pretty shitty. <clears throat> but we don't have a like we have several open mics, but we don't have one. Uh, in particular, that's like, okay, just so you guys know, the, like you're like the audience, you need to understand, like these comedians, they're probably going to be funny, but there's probably going to be a lot that aren't funny mm. because they're they're trying to find out what's funny about this idea that they have, and that's the point of the open mic. And so, <clears throat> there's a kind of a stigma uh, that's kind of put on the comedians when they're going to an open mic, where uh, only a few of them that I know of will, like, actually try their new stuff at the open mic, uh, where a lot of them are, like, trying to be funny so that promoters will put them on a paid show or or, or they'll be put on a show that isn't an open mic. And so they're not, like, working on their craft as much. And they're, like, trying to make sure that the audience is good. And the promoter's trying to make sure that the audience keeps coming back. Like, we we need a a dedicated comedy club 
uh, that is that understand like the, the, the whoever's running it understands that w- how comedy works and right. is able to like uh, help the not just the, the the comedians but also like influence the audience to be like yeah you know like this is you know Monday through Friday we're doing these open mics or Monday through Thursday we're doing these open mic things but Friday through Saturday is when the real shows happen so like they need to make their money on those days and right. then they just have like the mostly comedians are coming in Monday through Thursday to like work on stuff right just to take risks yeah. And- <clears throat> so it's just really weird and it's it's this really odd position that Hawaii particularly is in because it's such a small place and the the and so much of the nightlife here is divided in these weird ways where like there there's not like a a, a safe place for creative types to grow in Hawaii because mm-hmm. it's like you're gonna. You need to get to a point really fast where failure is going to hurt you a lot. And if you're not ready when you hit that point, you're just gonna end up dropping out, and then no one's gonna pay attention to you anymore. Right. And it's mm. it's really, it's odd. Yeah, it's just strange. so like people can't take the time to actually grow. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> Fresh Cafe just closed down too. Like, how does that affect the poetry scene? Because I remember going to those things on was it first Thursdays? They used to be like packed as shit, man. So the. I have not been to. They moved to Hawaiian Bryan's, uh, and uh-huh. I have not been to their new setup for the Poetry Slam there. But I did hear that the th- the problem with Fresh Cafe, as far as I was concerned as a poet, was that there first at the beginning they had that huge door, mm-hmm. yeah. so people outside would be smoking and talking during the show, which was oh, very yeah. distracting. And then they have like half the wall is just a bar, right? So there's yeah, people yeah. drinking and. So it, it was an environment where half the audience maybe wasn't paying attention at any given moment, uh, which was a really, like, shitty environment for a poet because if you wanted to win the room, you had to do something so reductive and stupid that you could get the attention <clears throat> of drunk people who didn't want to listen to poetry but were more in, focused on, like, hooking up for the night. It's, yeah. it's like the same envir- <clears throat> environment with comedy. Because like comedy and slam poetry are very much uh, arts where the audience needs to be paying attention, but not necessarily participating. Right. And so, and, and that's another thing that I've noticed. Hawaii audiences are very particular with is like if they're not really participating, for the most part, they're not going to be paying attention either. Hmm. True. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, but I hear that the new place because it's more of a actual stage setup, so it has a dark area and a lighted area, which mm. Fresh Cafe didn't have. The whole room is pretty Little. much lighted. Yeah. Uh which changes the dynamic because then it's not a performance, then it's like, "Oh, mm. cool hangout spot." Yeah. Uh I think that the new spot because of the stage and the sort of elevation too, and also the fact that the sound is an actual Are, are they doing it in space. the studio or in the or in Crossroads? I think they're doing it in Crossroads, yeah. Because wow, they've a got a space they've it. got a big audience, so I think yeah. I don't know if it it'll be interesting to see if they can maintain the audience because yeah. I think they've have regularly around like two hundred to three hundred people coming through the slam every month. Oh wow, uh, nice! Which is down actually. When I was, Fuck, I wish we had that kind of fucking numbers in the <laughs> comedy scene, it, shit, or a hip hop scene. Like if you had five hundred people coming through concerts on a monthly basis, yeah, yeah. like because mm. in twenty ten when I first started slamming. At one slam in April of 2010, they had, I want to say, like, 550 or 600 people come out to a show one night. Yeah. And it was just... It's a lot of fucking people. Yeah, in Fresh Cafe, that, sure. that night, like, there, it was standing room only inside. Mm-hmm. People were standing outside the door. People yeah, were standing a couple of those upstairs. It was just, nuts. Yeah, yeah, So, now that you're doing the rap thing, man, are you trying to break away from the slam poetry stuff and focus on the rap? Or are you going to try and do both, or... Is this like I, I a little, so. just a little diversion? I haven't really written poetry in a, a good year. Uh, uh, I've just been writing a lot of songs <clears throat> and music. I love poetry, uh, but I can't write it anymore. It's it's weird. Yeah. Like everything I write comes out sounding like a speech, and it's very much when I think about it, it's not poetic. Mm-hmm. But if I write it in a song in rhyme form, I can get to that poetic place in yeah. a way that I can't if I just write it free. Well, honestly, I think I, like I personally feel that uh, a lot of what uh, is happening popularly in the hip hop <coughs> scene uh, is missing that that poetry element to it. Like, there's a lot of people just Everyone's repeating just things, yeah, mumbling or repeating <laughs> things. <laughs> and, <clears throat> there's a whole Vice article on why is everybody mumbling, even Rihanna. 
Yeah, and <laughs> that, that's kind of like that's the thing is like everyone's just kind of copying these things that are like semi popular through the <laughs> the drug like that, that's kind of what happened with trap and uh you think it's and dubstep and whatnot it's just it's a just, bunch of these drug out rappers that just started deciding to rap and that's why they're mumbling maybe they're like socially retarded I, or something i have no idea what it is but it, it just it feels like Speech one impediments. of the, a big thing that's missing from mainstream hip-hop is like lyricism and i think that like the the at least the the hip-hop artists that i really enjoy are these like lyrical geniuses right and so, like, there's a, like I've been t- being turned on more and more to like the, a lot of these underground hip hop people from various places that are like talking. Like the one that I get passed around a lot is a bunch of people talk, a bunch of different people talking about how hip hop is dying, and they're going to be the ones to revive it mm. because. But like, I, I like what they're what they're the way that they're presenting it because it, it's it's very heavy lyrically, and they 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 make incredible metaphor with it and whatnot, right. and they they use the the lyrics themselves. To a, a, as sort of an instrument in what they're doing, mm. and I think that a lot of popular hip hop is missing that. Mm-hmm. I, I think, think a lot so. of popular music is missing that. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So, it's oh, go ahead. I was gonna ask you what kind of like uh, are you super lyrical in your raps, man? Are you trying to develop that kind of style? And you're because I know you're a socially conscious dude. Do you try to bring that kind of uh, kind of uh, <clears throat> lens into your work? That view into your yeah. It's a. Shit? I think there are like two strong pushes in my writing one is like a very political focus where a lot of the reading i do is focus on politics and social justice movements in Mm. the united states and globally too but focus you know more at home Mm. uh and my writing for school is very much uh i'm a phd student at the university of hawaii studying education so a lot of my writing there is focused on how do we improve education and obviously like you can't just take a essay for graduate studies and turn it into a rap uh, so it's it's actually an interesting challenge there because it's how do you take a message that generally when it's delivered requires 20 pages and a lot of footnotes and turn that into something that you can rhyme <clears throat> in two bars. That's that is the exact problem that I'm facing right now because I'm <clears throat> one of the ideas that I had for our comedy rap thing was uh, something that I'm passionate about because like like I'm called Science Ben all this other bullshit. Um, but <clears throat> I wanted to do uh, a rap song where it was me and Cozy going back and forth, uh, and I'm essentially explaining um, uh, Those logical fallacies. <clears throat> logical fallacies. Oh, that'd be great! Like, so, like all of them? Yeah. Yeah. We'll, oh, like uh, we'll, we decided that like if we went with we all of them, like 12, it'd be right? like, yeah, There's I think like, we picked twelve because like oh, okay, all of them okay. is a lot. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially yeah. for like a three minute song. So like the idea was he was gonna. Uh, uh, like come at me with with a logical fallacy, and I was gonna explain why that's that's bad, and we were just gonna kind of debate back and forth, and I was just gonna point out all the logical fallacies, and then it, it was gonna supposed to sum up about why logical fallacies are harmful to intellectual thought. I'm uh, I really want your <laughs> album to come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like really excited about this. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. And we just need to find the time to actually sit down yeah, and, and work on these things. Yeah, learn about logical fallacies because I'm having difficulty wrapping my head around that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, but, but like we, we selected like 12 of them, like um, Straw Man. Straw and, Man. Uh, yeah. I can't even remember what 12 we went through, but we, we picked a whole bunch of them that we, we, we were going to break down. We were going to do like a versus sort of thing. And then um, honestly, what made me want to change it was I listened to uh, Little Dickie's uh, – professional where he's Little going Dickie. back and forth with uh or the snoop dog and there's no real verses or, or breaks or anything in it and it's just it's much more like it's just him and snoop dog talking right and that and i was like that would make more sense and we could probably fit more into it doing it that way and so that's what, what has is the now plan for mm-hmm. the the logical fallacy that's song. great <clears throat> yeah man i think the the atmosphere in hip hop right now. Nobody's really talking about the socially the social issues that are happening right now. And I feel like there's so mm-hmm. much for people to be like pissed off and angry and get creative about. But I feel like nobody really is really touching on that. I don't know. Maybe like who? I think I, I'm really excited about Mick Jenkins right now out of Chicago. Mm-hmm. He's a uh, the the thing about him is that he writes things with political content without making it preachy. Which is the biggest challenge yeah, I yeah, have because, yeah. like, I could write about politics, but it's gonna be preachy. Like, how do I make a song that is catchy, but also might convince you to think differently about something, yeah. or or to to f- 
care about something that you don't care about already. Um, and I think the way that I'm, I've been approaching it is to try to use a lot of uh, metaphor and imagery to get to hook people in on different levels mm-hmm. because uh, <clears throat> if you just approach it straight, and especially for me as like a half white dude rapping who can't mumble, like it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard for me to mumble. That's a good thing. Uh, I mean, it's good, but it's like good I can't sound. I can't sound like a lot of other well, artists. You should. You could. You should consider comedy because comedy is always a an ear catcher. That that's what I I. I, I have thought about stand-up comedy for a while because Mm -hmm. especially when I start, I stopped being able to write for slam. I was like, I could probably make this funny yeah, or like make really extended dark setups for things. Oh yeah. I mean the, the, I wrote a few jokes recently and I've, I've been in this ultra, like I've, I've been a nihilist for a long time, but I've been in this like ultra nihilistic (laughs) mood since I got, uh, since I got laid off from my job in, in December. And like, I wrote some new jokes and they were like, so nihilistic. It was just so bad. <laughs> it was heavy. Anyway, but <clears throat> but I mean, it, it like I, I feel like comedy is a good way to to catch that attention. And if you can, uh, and you just and the thing too is like if you're if you're doing uh like a rap or anything like that, you just need a little bit of it. Just something that's like right. like like just like a one lyric here that like the rest of the song isn't comedic in any way, but like you have this one lyric and that people go like. Oh damn, that was fucking clever. Right. That, and that that's the, the 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 biggest turn uh uh turn on for most people with comedy is like, wow, I would have never thought of that and like that's right. really clever. It's less of the ha 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 that's funny, more of like, oh, that's that's fucking genius and <laughs> clever. And that's where like that's where a lot of my comedy uh <laughs> my influences in comedy come from. <clears throat> this is going to expose my uh my priorities right now, but that moment you're talking about, that like, aha, I've never thought of that moment, yeah. is when I write songs now, I think to myself, would a young girl put this as the caption for her Instagram photo? <laughs> oh, like like them Drake quotes? Yeah, Every time yeah, Drake yeah. drop well, a song, you see yeah, Drake quotes you know, everywhere. C- that, that's honestly like <laughs> what I think about, because I'm like, generally they pick like this quote that like sounds profound, and it's yeah. like, you know, and they put it on their photo of like an acai bowl or the yeah. beach. <laughs> Or like a scenic place at the yeah, end of yeah. a hike, uh, but 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 I honestly think about it that way because it's like if you can write something that makes that sticks with somebody enough mm. that they would put it out there yeah. and attach it to themselves, right? Because yeah. when you put a caption on a photo, if it's of yourself too, especially like it's literally you like putting those words on you and putting it out there. Yeah. And I want to be able to write songs and maybe jokes that people are willing to like. Yes, this is the line that got me, and yeah. I'm willing to show the world that this line mm-hmm. got me. Yeah, yeah. I, it, I just realized that Instagram captions have turned into the uh, the quotes in yearbooks, or like that's what yearbook yeah. yearbook quotes mm. have turned into is Instagram captions now, or like Tumblr posts. <clears throat> yeah, that too. There's a lot of those on there, and a lot of porn. <laughs> so much porn on Tumblr. Oh my god! They're like <laughs> at least probably 65 percent of that website is fucking it's porn. Porno. Yeah. And weird porn too. That's where like people go put like the really strange the out there porn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why search engines and hashtags are so dangerous. Because <laughs> like before, these people were like somewhat isolated from each other, but now they can all find each other. And yeah, it normally like there's only one dude within a fifty mile radius who's into like I don't know upside down clown porn. <laughs> upside down. Clown well porn. done. Well done. You know. Hmm. But now hmm. that person can literally connect with the other ten people on the planet who are into that, and they can have a. It's com- as if they're right next door, and <laughs> right. then they and they can together they can figure out ways to get more people interested in upside down exactly. clown porn. Exactly, they consolidation of power. See, if Hawaii hip hop could do <clears throat> that, we'd be onto something. Oh yeah, if we used hashtags. Ah to, <laughs> to- <laughs> oh, man, crazy Hawaii hip hop. So let's talk about your influences, man. Who who do you you know who do you listen to? Or no, scratch that question. How do you find inspiration for when you write lyrics? Ooh, uh, this last song I wrote, the single that's coming out is called "Go Crazy," and I wrote this. So I went to last year. I was away studying at the Harvard Graduate School of Education for nine months, and so I was living in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, right on right off a of Harvard campus. Yeah. And that was like a trip. Uh, 
I had never lived off island before. I traveled quite a bit, uh, but I never lived. And to go through a New England winter and be surrounded by all these type A, <clears throat> like always been the top of their class, always reaching for something more, mostly unhappy people for a year was a very humbling, but also like depressing experience. So I came home from that just sort of depressed. And I also, if you study education for a year formally, I think it's hard not to be depressed because you, you look at the problems that education faces and, and the problems that, that, that education could solve. Yeah. Yeah. And, and be like, why aren't people doing things? You know, like why do we still have a school to prison pipeline? Like stuff like that. And to study that for a year and then to be like, well, shit, what do I do? And then to come home that whole summer, this last summer, I was very depressed. Mm. I couldn't find a job during the summer too. So I was unemployed. Mm -hmm. Uh, I had just studied for a year and learned all this shit. I was like, I don't know what to do with this. I just feel bad. And then I started teaching at this school in the fall and I was linking up with Kamuela Kahuano, this local musician. And, uh, he wanted me to feature on another song. So I recorded the verse for that song and he was playing something on the carpet and something about the melody hit me and I started writing this song and I was like, fuck. And then I like wrote this verse and I was like, uh, the first line was like, break down in the middle of the street, break down when the landlord call him. Cause my mom and I got evicted, uh, basically because our landlord raised the rent $400. Holy shit. Yeah. And I was like, uh, that experience, I was like, holy shit. Like, I need to write. And I had done so much in academia. One of the things is like, you never write about yourself, Mm -hmm. which is weird, you know? Uh, And so like, I hadn't written anything about my experience. And so like, that was uh, connecting with my own shit. And now what I'm on right now is really, there's a lot of me that I haven't written about in Mm -hmm. songs or poems in a while. Mm -hmm. I wrote about it in poems and then I'd be like crying on stage and shit. And, uh, I think that's where I'm finding the most inspiration is actually having to deal with my own shit. Mm. Uh, but also my students, like I go to teach middle school every day and I have these like intelligent kids. Uh, there are these four girls in my speech and debate class, uh, and they're like 11 and 12 and they're, they'll like argue with me. And sometimes they're, like, beating me. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, that <laughs> That makes me, like, really hopeful and inspired. And then I'm like, well, I might as well write. Like, because I'm pretty good at writing and pretty good at making music. And the kids think it's all right music. So I'm like, oh, mm. I should write something that these kids will like. And <laughs> that'll hopefully, like, make them want to do good things and not be terrible people. Yeah, it's good that they're voicing their opinions. Because I remember in school when anybody, the teacher or something, asked a question, it would just be, like, a bunch of us looking at each other. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I feel like that's really what education is missing. And at poetry, like, made me very aware of that in a way. Because I was like, you go to the poetry slam and these kids would be saying stuff. And it's like, they'd be saying this stuff for the first time because no adult ever cared what they had to say. Mm-hmm. But you give a kid, like, three minutes on a microphone and promise not to interrupt them. And they'll tell you all kinds of shit. They'll be like, this is the gender identity crisis I'm having. Or, like, I don't know how to feel about relationships. Or, I come from an abusive home. Or, you know, like, I'm very unsure about the future. Or, I fucking hate my school. Like, it's an oppressive and depressing place. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and so, like, my whole thing is when I was in middle school and high school, I was very much sort of, like, I didn't say anything, mm-hmm. but I felt a lot of things. Oh, I was like, I right. hate this shit. Like, this is stupid. I'm not learning anything. This is useless. Uh, so my goal for my students is to give them that voice mm-hmm. and also to let them know that, like, those feelings they have are completely natural. But, like, everyone, their teachers and their parents are like, oh, don't think about the fact that you're unhappy with everything society asks you to do. Mm. You know, like, don't think about that till yeah. you're 30 and then have a crisis when you realize, why did I spend my whole life reaching for something that doesn't make me happy? Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, there's a lot of craziness with the, the entire educational system. Like, I, uh, one of the things I think I've said it on this podcast before is that, like, one of the big problems I see in education is that at some point, education moved away from teaching you how to learn to teaching you what to learn. Right. Which is always a bad thing. And I, I feel like we, we it, like you said, it's natural for people to have these like questions about how they're feeling and right. whatnot. 
and it's and if we were being taught more and more about like how to learn things, we would not be scared of these feelings that we're having, and we'd be questioning them more and like figuring ourselves out right. better. And it's it's just this whole weird thing. And then like when, when you mentioned the the prison to pipeline uh, or the prison uh, the school to prison pipeline earlier, uh, it's astonishing that like we can actually know that this thing exists and yet still nothing is being done of it. Right. And it's that, that on top of that, that's even more depressing. It's like, well, like, like we see it right here in front of us and it's just, nothing's being done about right. it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> it's such a, it, it can be a very depressing state. Yeah. So, and the, the and that's where I think like, uh, comedy and education kind of mash very well because I think some of the, the, or just, I say comedy, but I mean creativity in general, because like some of the best creative stuff comes from a highly educated minds, and some right. of some of the most um, educated things that ever happen were come from people who are not particularly educated but are highly creative. Right, and so they they mash together very well, and they they meet and create new bonds and whatnot. Like one of them, one of the things that like inspired my parents' generation. Um, to be much more scientist was uh, science based was an incredibly creative endeavor called uh, Cosmos uh, with a uh, <clears throat> Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan, yeah, yeah, sorry, with Carl Sagan, and that was a beautiful creative endeavor that also had these uh, great teaching aspects to it, and right. it inspired a lot of people to be a little bit more scientific about things. And so, like, we need more stuff like that. Like, that's why I was one of the people who was super excited when Neil deGrasse Tyson did the new Cosmos. Yes. Like, it's an amazing show, and it needs to be shown more often. <laughs> Were you also excited when Neil deGrasse Tyson told B.O.B. that, yes, yes the world is course. round? Of course. It's, it's <laughs> always fun. Like, like, I loved Interstellar, uh. but it's still fun to see when uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson sits there and goes, like, well, this isn't quite right and stuff like that. Right. So, I mean, that, that's, that's kind of what, uh, like, uh, like, he's one of my influences as far as being, like, a, a science communicator. Mm. It, it's just the idea of it's, like, well, there's, there's a lot of misinformation out there that we just kind of accept because it's everywhere and everyone's talking about this. Like, like most people still probably think that if you got ejected into space, you just die instantly and uh, right. everything is bad. It's like, no, if you hold your breath for, you know, however long you can hold your breath for, you can be out in the vacuum of space. It'll be really fucking cold and you'll probably die of the cold before you die of anything hmm. to deal with, like – loss of breath or there's not going to be this rapid explosion and whatnot right. it's not like all the air is trying to escape from your body it's good it's, to know yeah like you if you get if randomly ejected out into space you don't have a helmet on you got like 30 seconds to like hold my breath yeah fix yourself pray. up yeah i mean like realistically if you get to be completely honest if you get ejected out into space you're not going to get saved you're done so right. you might as right. well just like breathe out and die but at the same time like that's so nihilistic. I just went really <laughs> dark. I feel like BLB uh, was doing some publicity stuff, man, because he's got a project about to drop. So he just said some ridiculous shit. And the hell of people. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, yeah. I, but I just can't. I <clears throat> that the and so there are people like that in the Hawaii hip hop scene too. People who are like Illuminati run everything, and I'm oh, like, yeah. like yes, rich and powerful people run everything, but. They don't need a, se- a secret society to do that, you yeah. know. Rich and powerful. They do it out in the open. Yeah rich, oh, and, yeah, rich and powerful people have never needed a secret society to like run the world. They just do it. Yeah, the yeah. the Illuminati meme in particular really pisses me off because the Illuminati, like what, where the actual Illuminati came from, the Bavarian was no, it was scientists trying to hide from the Catholic Church because at the time the Catholic Church was killing them for mm-hmm. for not for mm-hmm. talking scientifically <laughs> about things. Mm-hmm. And so it, it was literally a group of scientists and high think, high-minded thinkers sitting there going like, well, the Catholic Church obviously isn't right, but we can't say that in public and we need to be able to meet new people. It was kind of like doing a hashtag thing where it's like right. we need to get more people. So they would put these codes out there and if anyone could figure out the code, they could be led to where the Illuminati meet and whatnot. And they're like, oh, you must be smart enough to like actually be a part of these things. That's mm. the original hashtag. Yeah, <laughs> Illuminati was the Illuminati. Like, Damn. Yeah. Whoa. Like a private <clears throat> Facebook group. Yeah, and like it, it for for me the Illuminati has always been this like f- positive force of scientific reasoning. Uh and then somewhere along the way it turned into lizard people. Lizard people. I blame BOB. Uh, reptilians. I blame people like BOB. 
And this thing is like while while it probably was uh, uh, a stunt to get more publicity out for his album drop or whatever. Mm. I also mm. think that I wouldn't put it past him to actually sit there and be like, because because the thing is like flat earthers have become more and more convincing with their bullshit. All mm-hmm. pseudoscience has like right. figured out ways to become more and more convincing. Like if you if you don't believe it, just go look at see how popular homeopathy is. Right. Well, Anything I mean, yeah. If you make like, because now they can make like YouTube videos with dramatic music, like Inception music in yeah. the background, and show all these pictures. And they can. And you're like, they can, Whoa. They they they've figured out ways to say things that sound intelligent but aren't. Right. Like like uh, one of the best examples of how. Uh, uh, permeated our culture is with with pseudoscience is the fact that there are healthcare providers that will cover acupuncture. Hmm. Acupuncture has been shown repeatedly to have absolutely no medical benefit whatsoever, but you can get your health provider to pay for it. Same thing with chiropractors. I chiropractors, actually I like chiropractors. I a lot of I people do. It. A lot of people do. But the thing is, it doesn't help in any way. It's like a massage. Oh, yeah, Chiropractic is just like a massage where it feels great, but there's no real health I benefits. I definitely so. don't think, like, the super <clears throat> health benefits are crazy. Mm-hmm. I think, like, it's more of the massage benefit yeah, for me and, where I'm like, I feel better fine. when my back is cracked and, like, I'll feel, like, weird if it's not. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, that's fine. But thinking that you have a medical issue that can be corrected by someone releasing CO2 from your joints oh, yeah, is yeah. not and scientific not in any way. Not cure my cancer. Exactly, yeah. And, but there's people out there who say like, oh, you have, this, you have this particular back issue, which happens if you actually look into it. It happens to be a muscular issue. But if you go and crack your back, it'll be better. And it's like, yeah, it feels better for a limited amount of time. And then it just becomes revolving door business for chiropractors. Right. And again, there's nothing wrong per se. Like the chiropracting, uh, chiropractors are a little bit more dangerous than massage therapy because mm-hmm. if they're if they aren't trained properly, they, could, they can yeah. seriously hurt someone when cause nerve damage and whatnot. Mm. But at the same time, it's not doing any like there's no super positive health benefit for chiropractic other than just feeling better for a little while. Mm-hmm. But there is this major negative, and so it needs to be seen that like the 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 costs far outweigh. The benefits, if you're taking it in any sort of serious sense. Right. Anyway, that's why they call me Science Ben. <laughs> Science Ben. Science Ben. Breaking it down yeah. for funny, the people. Funny thing about chiropractors, man. I got into an accident, like in high school, car accident, and uh, I had this like settlement case. But in order to get the money, I had to go to a chiropractor for a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did. And from the money that I got from the settlement... I bought my first turntables, so shout out to chiropractors Yo, let me get my turntables. I just like my chiropractor. <laughs> he's uh, a very large Samoan man. Oh, wow. And, like, very often, like, I'm lying on the table, and I'm, like, literally, like, this dude could kill me right now. <laughs> like, because he's got my ha- my head in his hands, yeah. and he's turning my neck <laughs> sideways, right? Yeah. And I'm, like, that. Ex- the experience of, of that is very... Uh, freeing, freeing, yeah. Where you really have to trust this person, yeah. to like not kill you because too far and I'm dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there, there's, there's enormous mental benefits to to these kinds of things, right? But like, part of the problem is most people, um, and and I, I hate to say it because it seems very negative towards most people, but just most people aren't mentally prepared to handle those sorts of mental challenges that come up with these things and so like there's a lot to be learned from meditation and from completely giving your 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 life up to someone else right like having your life in someone else's hands there's a lot to be learned mentally from that but it has turned into like the way i see it happening was these things kind of came up because there were really intelligent people who had these life-changing experiences and like you can have it too right and then a bunch of people who are not mentally capable or, or prepared to handle those sort of things, go through and do these things and like, well, I must have had my life changing experience. And then they just start spouting, um, start spouting out about it. Yeah. And it, it, it turns from intelligent and progressive to just idiotic and regressive I, very quickly. I think it's just that people, people have like this, <clears throat> not to talk shit about science, but yeah. people have this like overblown idea of what science is. Like, well, I don't know of, how many times kids have said, science says. And I'm like, science doesn't say anything. Exactly. You know, like, like just because a study somewhere showed something doesn't mean that that's true. Mm-hmm. Like, 
I totally agree. I'm sure that some study somewhere showed that chiropractic had a good effect. I guarantee some study showed it. But, like, that doesn't mean that all studies show it. And <clears throat> science never says some. Science is always, like, a bunch of scientists together yeah. doing their research. One of the things that, like, has been distorted, and, and part of it is from uh, a lot of religious propaganda put out against science to, to try and turn more mm. people back towards religion. But one of the things that people don't seem to get is that science is not in the business of proving things to be correct. They're in the right. business of proving things to be wrong. Right. And so the, the like the only like the science has never said like 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 the a big contention piece is the the word theory, where in scientific communities that is a body of work that has been shown to be true repeatedly. Right. Uh, and the, 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 we can say through evidence that we have a lot of it saying like, well, this isn't wrong. A lot, because we can see repeatedly over and over and over again that this has not been wrong. Right. And so uh, that's where a theory comes from. Like, gravity is a theory, but we all kind of accept it because no one's trying to disprove it. But I guarantee if someone who was silver-tongued enough went out there and would try to disprove uh, gravity, they could find reasons to do it. I'm sure if I really wanted to and you gave me a little bit of time, I could come up with a convincing argument for why we shouldn't be believing in gravity. And then B.O.B. would take on neil degrasse tyson exactly. and say no no gravity exactly but yeah it's just and and part of it too is uh so much of science has uh, has been intertwined and then has, has has also as it got further into its field has been separated from each other they don't they don't cross over as much right. as they need to anymore that people are able to have these things like um like using euclidean geometry you can sit there and prove that the world is flat. But the thing is, you can't just uh, rely on Euclidean geometry because Euclidean geometry doesn't uh, is not on a, on a big enough scale to really encompass what we know about the world. You need to go into non-Euclidean geometry and into uh, things on galactic or even universal scales to be able to understand that parallel lines are not actually parallel. They don't really exist. Right. Like one, one of the, the funniest things is... Um, uh, I remember when I first got told this, like I was, my mind was blown for like two weeks. But um, the foundation of uh, Euclidean geometry, which was the basically the foundation of all math ever, uh, at least coming out of Greece, mm-hmm. is that uh, like literally the 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 the, the foundation, the, the thing that started all was parallel lines are parallel because they're parallel. That seems true. It seems very true, but when you think about it, uh, if you understand anything about math, is you can't use something to prove itself. Right, yeah. It's and tautological. So, and so, like, the foundation of Euclidean geometry is a false statement, essentially. And, like, it, 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 under any normal circumstances, you'd be able to sit there and go, uh, like, well, we need to throw out Euclidean geometry completely. But the thing is, we have so many different scales in the way the universe works that Euclidean geometry has points where it... It can be very useful, and usually that's on a human scale. Right. And so there's all this craziness that you need to, like, kind of keep in the back of your mind while you're doing these other things. Uh, otherwise, you can be led astray mm. very, very easily. Mm. Speaking of geometry, <clears throat> what are some of the challenges that you face <laughs> in the rap and in, in trying, to, trying to do this rap thing, man? Because I was very challenged by geometry. <laughs> Uh, I didn't do too well in geometry (laughs) either. I think that for me, it's really trying to find a a spot in the community uh, because I I haven't really performed live hip hop much in the past couple of years. I was active a few years ago for a little bit and then I disappeared for three years. And now it's trying to like get back into the scene and perform and find places to perform where the music will be received well. The scene is very different. Yeah, it's actually feels like a better place for me now uh, because there are people playing with bands oh Uh, yeah yeah uh and like i've always been a performer where i could rap over a track but i vibe when i'm with musicians on stage you know kind of a jazz thing going on jazz yeah because i used to play in band i played the clarinet for seven years and totally a different vibe with a band perform with a band a couple times I love it. I love it so much. Like, I love freestyling with live musicians, uh, which is something I've done fairly constantly during those mm-hmm. three year time. I play with this guy, Jeremy Chang, a lot. And so for me, it's trying to recreate that experience in a different format. So mm-hmm. trying to figure out, like, what 
my live performances will look like. Like, is there a band? And then this project I'm working on with, with Chris Salvador, he's a singer songwriter. He plays guitar. He does loops and stuff. Uh, but the two of us would be fine for like a small show. Mm-hmm. You know, like we could do a Tiny Dust concert and rock it, and it'd be yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. But like, if we get to the Republic, right? Like, mm-hmm. can it just be the two of us, or do we have to? How do we take? the magic that we have when it's just the two of us and turn it into like a show a spectacle yeah. a spectacle and because <clears throat> i'm always about like production value i don't want to ever do a set where it's just like boring mm-hmm. uh, i want to like the sets to like push past what people are doing we now. should we should talk uh more in depth about this off air too because that's one of the things that i've been doing for a while now is like uh learning the dynamics of putting on a show yeah, I'd, and so like I'd we can to. we could definitely like work with this. Like I, I was actually uh, when we were thinking earlier about this stuff. Like I was actually thinking like me and Cozy should uh, shoot a video that you can put out with your your album or whatnot, or one that will be released once the album's out and stuff That'd like that. Sick. Like we could easily come up with some uh, some video some music video ideas for for songs that are coming up. And yeah, it, it. I think it it's all it all comes to me about packaging. Like I'm very product minded, and also I I love the process of doing this shit. But I think about, like, I want the product to be dope. And I want it to, I don't want to, like, cut corners, Mm -hmm. you know? Because I feel like a lot of local artists have so much talent. Mm. And then they cut corners to get their shit out. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And it's like, (laughs) yo, like, if you had mixed and mastered this track, it'd be be dope. But you released it unmixed, and it sounds like shit. Your raps are great. Your lyricism is on point. Your flow is perfect. The beat is jamming but you didn't mix or master this like and it's just like if you if they stepped back and were like i want to make this the best possible piece of art that it could be Mm -hmm. they could do so much more but i think there's like a rush and people feel a need to like get stuff out and i definitely know what that's like because i have 200 videos on youtube (laughs) to prove it uh but at this point for me it's like slowing down and being like I'm not going to put this out until it's very good and yeah. I feel yeah. very good about it. Like this single, I, we, me and Kamuela worked on it for seven months. Uh, and I think it's pretty good. Mm. But I wanted to release it a month ago and Kamuela was like, no, we need to get a different mix of it. Uh, we need to get a different – I was I, first I was like, we need a different mix of this. And he was like, I don't really think so. And I was like, so I paid $600 to get it remixed by somebody. And the mix came back and Kamuela listened to it and he's like – well, I don't like this mix, but I do like 80% of the things he did. So mm-hmm. I'm going to do 80% of the things he did, and then I want to get it mastered on my own. And I was like, uh, I like this mix, but I let Kamuela do it, and he sent it out to get mastered, and we spent another $250 on that. Mm. And it, the final mix sounds banging, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it took it took like that willingness to be like, well, we need to save this money and wait another month uh, to get there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's where I'm at now. If I can, like, stay slow, I feel very good. Mm. I feel like a big part of that, too, is that that, uh, sort of some of that lack of education that is prevalent in so much of society, too, where, like, people don't understand uh, the idea of what what makes something of quality. Uh, Because they're, they're, I was actually, I was having this argument with a good friend of mine not that long ago where I, my point, and I've made this point on the podcast ago, is that there's a difference between liking a movie and a movie being good. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, like there's plenty of bad movies that I love, but I'm not going to sit there and call them good movies. Right. And there's plenty of great movies that I don't really care for, but I can still sit there and objectively say that they're good. Right. And I think that there's uh, another thing that <coughs> the same sort of thing happens with everything where there, there is this, uh, like his, his point was that there's how, how can you say that uh, art is not is good or bad because it's all objective. Right. And I get that to a point <clears throat> but I think that there is also standards that are created for production value. Like there, there, there's an art side of being creative, but there's also uh, a production value of right. something. And there's a science side too, right? Because yes. like the reason mastering engineers can get paid two hundred fifty dollars to master my track is because they know that the human brain wants these frequencies, right? Right. But I don't know that, like honest, and I don't expect any random lyricist mm-hmm. on this island to know that and you don't need to know that really it's for nice the most part, it, it be, yeah. for the most part right but you have to know that that exists yeah you have to know that there's more to it than just random like there there are some people who there are some artists i should say who by random chance are 
lucky enough and talented enough to achieve these goals without knowing that they're doing those things. Right. But there is a science behind it. Like, uh, like I was really big in photography for a very long time. And like, we can sit there and we can objectively say that, uh, a photo, a, a photograph that is taken, uh, in with the rule of thirds versus one that's taken without the rule of thirds is more aesthetically pleasing. And more people will like the, this, right. vi- this, this, uh, this photograph because of these particular things. It's, it's the way it's the patterns that our brain, right. Uh, receives in. And so like, again, it helps to know these things, but you don't have to. Like some people right. get lucky and they just happen to do these things naturally. But uh, to have something of quality and worth th- something, uh, it, it's you're either going to be really lucky, and most people are not right. able to do that. Mm-hmm. Like and the majority of people are not going to just randomly happen to like shit out this piece right. of amazing gold. But there's nothing. The thing that <clears throat> yeah, the thing that bothers me the most is I'm not bothered at all if people want to like go for a Remy boys sound mm-hmm. and like, you know, or, or, or if people just want to like have fun, right. And fuck around and make music. That's just fun. And like, you know, not, but what gets me is when people make shitty music and then go, why doesn't anybody like my music? That that's the point where it gets me, where I'm like, if you don't put in that extra effort to make it dope. And mm-hmm. then you're like, why isn't anybody backing up my shit? Or, you know, like, those are the people in the Hawaii hip hop scene where I'm like the most like, don't don't come up with this attitude of like why isn't anybody putting me on like if you didn't mix and master yeah if you didn't your put shit. in the work you know like it. like you have to earn that respect almost which my whole thing is like my whole goal with music is uh, very early on I think I was seeing like the Deadbeats perform at Jazz Minds yeah. like five years ago and I was like you know. I don't need to be like on the radio, but it'd be dope if one day these musicians on stage respected my art, mm-hmm. you know, like that. And and I was like, that's all I need to do. Cause I like what they're doing. And if they see my art or hear it and are like, that's dope. He's good. Then I'm good. Mm-hmm. And like, I got to have Matty Wong and Ethan Capone on this track and that was like a big moment for me. Cause I was like, you know, like you were like some of the first, Matty Wong, that's music. the sax guy, right? The sax guy, Matty, and Ethan Capone on the keyboard, man. Like, those were, like, some of the first musicians where I, like, saw them, and I was just like, holy shit, I didn't... Because I was, like, 19, 18, 19, and this was the first time I was really seeing live music in Hawaii like that. Yeah. And I was just like, I didn't know this existed my whole life. Mm-hmm. And that was, like, the first image I had. So, that was a ramble, but... That's why I'm doing it's this. It's okay. I ramble all the fucking I'm, time. <laughs> I'm doing this so that uh, yeah. those people, you know, are like Ill Hill Society yeah. or Prolific Unknowns. Like, when Big Mox tells me, like, your shit's good, I'm like, yo, yes, what I, yeah. I did it. I <laughs> the, did it. The first rap song I ever made, I sent it right away to Mox, and I was just, like, waiting for his response. And he was like, yo, it's good. You know, it's, he didn't say much. It was just, like, one line, but in my head, like... Mox is like a legend to me. He's like an OG. Right. So like his opinion like weighed a lot to me. You know what right. I'm saying? And then after that, that was before even Ill Hill started, man. I was just I was just fucking around. Somebody, you know, just to fuck around and rap. And after that, I was just like, okay, I'm gonna do this. Yeah, I mean <laughs> like there are so many artists. I think that's the other thing is like I try to pick like the best people to yeah. to who's I'm I'm not trying to get like everyone's respect because I think that's a losing game. Yes. Uh, or I don't even need everybody to like me. But if five really dope people like me, mm-hmm. then I'm good. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's all I really need. Yeah, and I I think that's uh uh something that's kind of lacking too is is that um that that want to impress not just the audience, but impress the people that inspired you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I think that there, there's a small group of people in every community, uh, community that do go for that, that they they go for that much more than they go for getting the audience. Like getting the audience is a great benefit, but it's always like, you know, I'm they're they're, they're going to criticize their own work until, uh, they're even after someone else who they respect tells them that it's good. They're still going to keep criticizing the work, but that, that's what they, they look more for than that, uh, respect of the audience right which uh the, but the, there's a larger part of every community that is much more about like because because i think that larger part of that of each community came from being an audience member to to doing these things mm. they're always like well i liked it when 
the artist recognized me, and then they just go solely for that instead of for uh, the quality that uh, of the people that they were um, right being inspired by. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> Cool. How are we on time? Like, We're about know. an hour right now. We can okay. keep going if we want. Hour twenty. Yeah, we can keep going. You want to keep? Yeah, unless you got to go somewhere. No, I'm I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. So, can we look forward to like a project? Are you putting together a project, or are you just gonna be dropping like little singles? Yeah. So this single is dropping, and it's the first single that I've ever released with like original production. I did a mixtape last year yeah. while I was at Harvard. It's called Grad Life, um, huh. and it's just me rapping over some beats. Yeah, like yeah. it's just. There are like, there's like one hook on that whole thing. Uh, it's just straight raps. And I needed to get it out. Uh, then I've got this four-track EP with Chris Salvador. And I've started writing on what I think is either going to be an EP or is going to morph into my uh, full-length release. I'm not sure what I want to do first. <clears throat> I'm hoping to have Imua Garza produce it. Uh, that's who me and Chris have been working with uh, out at Zio Music. Uh, OPE Picker? Yeah, OPE yeah. Pickers. Yeah, he was uh, the he produced their music and he was like lead in that band. Nice. Uh, and now he just does a lot of production work and he's fantastic, talented musician. Um, and just been working with him. And I want him to produce my solo album because I want it to be... He comes from a very different place because he's not a hip hop artist primarily, but he listens to all kinds of music, like gospel music, and yeah. he produces all kinds of music, like from screamo to acoustic stuff to gospel to Hawaiian music. And so I think that's always fun is like hearing an artist like stretch out into other things that they they don't normally do. Yeah, and like for me, I want to collaborate with people like that because. I am very much hip hop centered. Mm -hmm. And so like, I don't really have a big gospel background at all. So if somebody in the studio, emo is like throwing gospel sounds on, or he's like, no, you know, we should put in like a organ like this. I'm like, yeah, I would have never thought I would, I would have never got there. Yeah. It, it, that that always creates such cool, like fusions of things when someone who is not a part of scene is working with someone who's another scene because they take these different influences into these things. Right. And so they come up with something that's completely new all, most of the time. And it's just like, wow, that, that mixes so well together. Yeah. Um, so I've got, I've got the writing, you know, I, I've, I've been writing a lot and I'm at the point now where I'm really thinking through instrumentation. So mm-hmm. I have the first song of whatever that EP or um, album is mapped out in my head so i have the verses and i have the instrumentation that i want and then after i'm done with this project with chris i'll go in with imua and try to track out that first song and then see where it evolves from there like Mm. have him play beats for me or like ask him i want this sound or write and then just give it to him because yeah i have the material like i've i've written so i didn't realize like how much i'd written and then i was like looking i've written like thousands of verses like because I would just sit and write and write a verse and spit it. And mm. now it's like a muscle where I've practiced it a lot. And if I want to write, I can write. Mm-hmm. Um, That's what's up. I can't do that. I always got to write when I feel like it, man. I have difficulty like forcing myself how to write. But I guess it comes with all that practice, right? Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I definitely force myself to write a lot of times. Uh, I, nowadays, like I, I generally won't write until I'm like ready to. But mm. when I want to write, like writer's block doesn't really get me down because in poetry one of the first things uh with the writing workshops like our one of my early mentors was this poet named darren cambra and he had three rules the first rule was constant forward motion so when you're writing like you don't stop Mm -hmm. the second rule was uh be in the moment so just like let it go Mm -hmm. and the third rule was to like focus and try to bring it back uh and he also always told us that there were no wrong answers because like i feel like a lot of times when I started writing, I would feel like, oh, this is sucks or this is shitty. Uh, and I would just stop writing. And now I'm just like, ah, this is shitty, but going to keep writing. <laughs> and sometimes, like, I'll write three verses and they're all shitty. And I'll just throw them all away and yeah. write three more. That's interesting. How how concerned are you with, like, keeping it real? Because um, you obviously talk about shit that you're passionate about. And for me, I like to make shit up. 
I have no concern over like uh. keeping it real or whatever. I'll talk about killing people and shit like that, <laughs> violence and all that shit. But if you know me as a person, I'm totally not that way. But for some reason, people still let it slide about me. Uh, like I'm uh. just making shit up, but they let it slide. I don't know if it's because of the way that I rap it or something. But I was always, always <laughs> well, wondering. I think that's like, kind of like a like a Ghostface Killer kind of thing. Where Ghostface Killer was like street, right? Yeah. But he was also rapping some shit. Where it's like you <laughs> you're not doing this. Like you aren't a mafia dog, Ghostface Killer. Like yeah. you're a rapper. Like <laughs> let's be real. But I think that there, to a certain extent, if you can do it like artfully. Huh. Uh, that's like the difference, you know? And yeah. I think that as long as you're doing it in an artful and interesting and original way, you can say anything you want. Like half the shit I write is just about how dope I am yeah. and how much, like, cause I feel like half the shit of hip hop is how much better I am than you, hmm. which is a weird genre, right? It's, it's like one of the only genres where you will go to a concert and pay for somebody to rap at you for an hour about how much better their life is than yours. Right? Yeah. Like yeah. G Easy is coming to town next month. And I listened to his latest album and his whole album is like this sad song about, uh, oh, this fame is so terrible. Like, it's it's just so <laughs> terrible that everywhere I go, women throw themselves at me and the money doesn't seem to fill the hole in my heart. Well, and cry, I'm like, baby. yeah, <laughs> but, but also like, it's this like humble, not even humble brag. It's just the whole thing is a brag about my life's fucking great and your life isn't, but mm. I'm dissatisfied with my life. And I'm like, I couldn't make that music, to be honest. Like, I couldn't. So I tr- the one thing that I really can't do is to to say that my life is shit when it isn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think I could like fake I, that. I feel like that would be an interesting like writing exercise to see if you can like like sit there and force yourself. Yeah, to be like I'm struggling because honestly, and I, I think that that's for me keeping it real <clears throat> is being like, you know, like I was never poor, like I was never rich, mm-hmm. but I was never like poor, yeah. and that's something that I can't write about yeah, and like never broke the bottom of middle class right sort of you know and like in terms of like crime like i've done some illegal drugs but i'm not like a crazy druggie so i can't write about that because it would just be a little bit dishonest for me to to say that and like even in terms of violent shit like i'll talk i'll talk about chopping people in half with a katana if i can find a rhyme for katana <laughs> but everybody knows that i don't have a katana yeah, like yeah. i i'm not a violent person uh, so yeah. uh yeah, I try to keep it real. Word. I try to. I've been taking. Ch- I've been taking this like Grant Morrison philosophy. Have you heard of him? He's just like a. He's a comic book writer, and he was on that. It was the Kevin Smith podcast where they were talking about Batman. He was making this comparison between Batman. Fat man Je- on Batman. Between Batman and Jesus Christ, and he's talking about how like it. These ideas of Batman or Jesus Christ, religion, etc. They don't have to <clears throat> be real. They mm-hmm. just have to feel real mm-hmm. and like touch a certain human button. And be like believable in that sense, so I think that's like my little. Well, thing that, I, that's a big thing that happened with uh, the the Man of Steel movie was they put in a lot of Christian undertones into it, and so mm. even though there's no like, can I like, to be honest, Superman is much more of a socialist hero than he is a a, mm. a Jesus. Well, like, I mean, don't get me wrong, Jesus is a was a bit of a socialist too when you dig into a lot of his stories and whatnot, but uh, there there's not any hard connections with any superhero per se oh well, i'm sure there's some that's based on jesus but i mean any of the the more mainstream ones uh per se with with re- any religious undertones but they'll put them in there uh to try and get that audience yeah it's a it's a weird <clears throat> aspect of entertainment yeah is seeking an audience <clears throat> to, so, to fill the seats yeah so whenever i write my raps like i can i write all this crazy shit and like one of my goals is to let people think that i'm crazy <laughs> when i'm really not i mean i've had people come up to me like concerned about like <laughs> my life like is cozy okay like my own <laughs> friends like yeah, you know i'm just fucking i'm just trying to be entertaining man try to be creative i'm just rapping man yeah, i'm just rapping yeah. i'm not really gonna kill myself <laughs> I, I think like that's the kind of whole what is the odd odd future Oh, yeah. It's so weird that I'm forgetting this, but I really don't listen to their music, except, like, I listened to it once and then was like, not really for me, but I can see why people like this, you know? Like, Tyler, the creator, is rapping about... He's like Eminem, like, but more than Eminem, right? Because Eminem was talking about raping his mother and stuff that was just, like, at the time, people were like, you can't say that on the radio. Like, that's crazy. This is offensive and, like, wild, right? Mm -hmm. But 
for a whole generation of young people, they were like, oh, yeah, we're, we're cool with this. Like, yeah, yeah. it's kind of homophobic and sexist and violent, but something about it feels right, you know? Uh, and I think there is something about that that, like, touches through to people. And I think it is because, like, we live in this kind of violent mm. dystopian world, you know? I think, I, I like, we, we do, but we don't at the same time. Like, we... We hear about this violent dystopian right. world all around us, but we don't see it, and so right. it appeals to the 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 what I think is happening is like it appeals to this uh, this want to hear stories. Like right. I, every kind of human grows up hearing stories about it's it's a huge way in which we used to learn how things how the world worked was through right. hearing the stories of other stuff and a lot of <clears throat> metaphor and whatnot, mm. uh, and that's why metaphor is so, such a powerful force. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that because there's uh, a, a narrative going on, particularly in news and media, where it's like, you need to be afraid of the world, right. even though all around us, what we're seeing and what we're living in, we really Pretty have calm. no real reason to yeah. be afraid. Uh, it appeals to this this storyteller, uh, this, story, this yearn for a storyteller, where we're like, right. oh, we're hearing these things. And it's it's causing these emotional effects into us, even though our environment isn't giving these emotional effects. Right. I I think that there is. Yeah. It. I feel like there's like the invisible violence, and then those songs and stories kind of make it real. Where it's something mm-hmm. you can latch onto, or like even the conspiracy theories we were talking about earlier. You know, like the people who believe in the Illuminati, like they're reaching for some explanation for like the way that they feel. Right. You know. And nobody's giving it to them straight so they'll take anything they'll yeah. be like yeah i'll i'll buy that like tyler the creator whatever like yes good uh but i think that and you know part of it is like the decline of religion you know like we used to reach for the explanations and the stories and the meanings in different places yeah because we cause don't for the longest time religion was the only explanation for things yeah and, you had a complete and, story yeah and and it's very hard for a lot of people to get past that point where they go oh, there probably isn't actual meaning to any of this except for the meaning that we give. Like, that's a hard thing for a lot of people to accept right. is that there isn't a purpose to life and that there isn't uh, any grand thing that's going to happen, make your life better and all this other right. stuff. And so, like, people will they'll, they'll let go of reason to right. just to have that, that, that comfort that comes with those kind of things. And it, there's good and bad that comes with that. Like, I, I'm not saying it's a, a completely horrible thing. Like, there's a lot of good that can, can come from that. Like, you can it can cause you to live a very he- uh, healthy and productive life. Right. But at the same time, you, there's extremes to each side. You know, you get down the... you get the, you know, Like, if you get heavy into nihilism, like, far more than you should, then it's like, well, you're completely uneffective and unable to do anything because you're like well there's no point in doing anything right. so i'm just not gonna do anything but at the same time if you're like uh then you have uh the opposite end of that where it's like jesus take the wheel and it's like i'm not gonna do anything because jesus is gonna take care of everything jesus and so, got me yeah it, there's like there's always this healthy center that uh, should be found in most things but there's always gonna be people that are trying to drag you one way or the other right and that's where it gets scary very a religious person i I'm a spiritual person, but not a religious person. I've been... I always hear that. I've, like, I'm I know, not right? religious, but... I say that, too. Yeah. Like, I'm not religious, but I consider myself spiritual. Yeah. I still don't understand what spirituality is, so, really. But I just say it because I feel it, like it... Oh, you're not religious? Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, but he's spiritual, so it's okay. I one, will, of, one of my favorite jokes, um, <laughs> and I, I believe it's actually a Daniel Tosh joke, where he goes... Uh, uh, my favorite thing whenever a girl tells me, oh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, is that I, t- I like to tell her, oh, I'm not honest, but I find you interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think <clears throat> I am becoming more religious, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. like with each passing day. Mm-hmm. Um, because there is that kind of like, you know, in the absence of a story, it makes you in a very responsible place because it's like, well, I'm the only one who gets to determine if my life has meaning, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that that has actually – there was a period where I was like, this is great. You know, like I like just me making the meaning for all of my life. But mm-hmm. recently I've been like, you know, I could see myself going to a church and listening to this story about the world. I, I don't need to buy everything uncritically. But I do think that it 
the stories that communities share, it'd be nice to share more stories with like many people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and that was actually something that I've been learning a little bit more about recently is like part of the reason that uh, particularly like the Jewish community was so strong is because of the community less the religious side of it. Right. And so it was much more about that communal being together and all sharing these things, whether they're ideas or like traditions and exactly. whatnot. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, and again, like the, the reason, like uh, I'm, I'm a borderline uh, anti-religious person, mm. anti-theist, if you will. Um, I, I'm not quite ready to sit there and say all religion is horrible and blah, 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 blah. Right. But at the same time, like I, I see the point of the, the serious harm that can come from it. And so like, I'm, I'm, I'm very on that border of being completely anti-religious to being like, ah, eh, you know, just don't let it affect me sort of thing. Right. And, uh, I, I see the, the benefits that can happen, but part of, um, Part of it needs to go hand in hand with getting those benefits is like you were uh, harping on earlier is education. Right. Like you need to be educated enough to accept the benefits without all the uh, the negatives. Right. Uh, and I think that one of the the major harmful things in like the the more heavier religious sides of things is they don't want you to be educated. They want you to just accept everything that is said. Right. Like if you're a young woman and the church is telling you your body is a sin and you shouldn't have sex and you should save yourself for the man you're going to marry, while also not holding quite the same standards for the men in the church, like you as a young woman should hopefully be educated enough to know that that's bullshit, exactly. right? Exactly. You know, and that I think that's, it's like, how do you strike a balance between having a place like a church that brings people together to share in a lot of really dope things mm -hmm. uh, without, you know, creating rules and sort of narratives that fuck up certain groups of people almost exclusively, yeah. you know, like, like the churches that really fuck over women or like churches that exclude certain uh, ethnic minorities, you know, like that's the question. It's like, how do you make a community without fucking people over? And I think hip hop is like one of those things where... It's a community that gets there in some ways, yes. you know, uh, and not in an, in other ways. Because yeah. at, like, the Shingo 2 concert, like, Shing, he's from, Shingo's from Japan, right? And, like, without hip-hop, I listened to Nujabes when I was getting into hip-hop. So I knew his songs, and his songs made me feel some kind of way. Uh, and last night, I'm, like, standing there with 200 other people who also felt some kind of way because of the song. Mm. And the song <clears throat> was, like, a story that we all shared. Yeah. Even though we never knew each other, but the thing that I was thinking about as I walked home from the concert is I was like, you know, if not for that concert, I probably wouldn't have known that 200 other people felt the same way. Yeah. I could have, like, imagined it and looked at the view count on YouTube and been like, oh, look, these people like the same thing. Yeah. But to see everybody, like, dancing and, like, you know, bobbing and, like, vibing hands to and it, vibing yeah. to it, yeah. then you're like, oh, shit, like... This is a real response, and so that's where hip hop is like a yeah, church for me. I think that uh, that there's going we're going to see <clears throat> more and more of that coming out is where these like subcultures and whatnot are going to become more bigger, mm. and people are going to move away from uh, uh, like uh, my hope is they move away from the the dogma of the various religions that it, it has tend to be hyper uh, pseudo intellectual or anti intellectual right. even. And they're going to move into these cultures where, like, part of the reason why people are still clinging, I think, part of the reason why people are still clinging on to religion is because of these traditions that occur. And, like, the traditions, uh, the new world tradition, the new cultural and uh, spiritual traditions, if you will, haven't had time to, like, really be created into religion or into traditions. Because, I mean, like, Christmas is a thing that, like, so many people observe, even though, like, I'm sure most people don't believe uh, in Santa and all, and all the right. other mythology of the of the thing. But it's just something to observe because it's a tradition to do so. Right. And I think that eventually we're going to start to see more and more people, more and more traditions being created uh, around uh, more scientific-based things and mm. more and more culturally uh, accepted things that, like, or, or more accepting of people and right. of various faiths and whatnot. And so, like, we're going to start to see, we're already starting to see sort of a decline in religion and more, uh, again, for lack of a better term, spirituality, where right. it's like people have, like spirituality seems to be a label uh, for things that people don't know what else to call it. Right. And 
uh, I think like community is just as it, like it doesn't sound as grand. And right. I think that eventually it'll just it'll be, be become just communities of people ha- who have these traditions of things and whatnot. Right. The the I think the ultimate goal is to have those traditions be based in intelligence instead of in faith, because right. faith can be can be very harmful when it's not. Uh, questioned and not uh, observed properly right. and whatnot. It's, like, I mean, it's got to be critical because, yes. like hip hop, for <clears throat> instance, like hip hop. A lot of hip hop communities have the same problems as the church. You know, like women are not safe there. You know, like mm-hmm. and are oppressed by men. And unless we like critically look at that and go like, how come there's never a female MC? Like, how, like people asked, how come there's never a female pastor? You know, like until we ask those questions, then it's not. I think that's the difference. Like when we have those community spaces, if we're critical and we say, why is this that way and Mm -hmm. not a different way, then we can like push those spaces to be, to be better, you know? And I think you're right that intelligence and education is the key to like getting people to that place where they can be like, wait a second, this is kind of fucked up. Like we should rethink this. Yeah. I've, I've been waiting like, uh, like this actually recently popped into my head like a week ago and I've been thinking like, I think one of the things that hip hop would really benefit from is like a really amazing, just like a, a Kanye level of of expertise in the craft, like heavy gay rapper. It'd be it'd be dope. There's like uh, a few. Really, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, they're exciting uh, queer and transgender artists that are making like crazy stuff, mm-hmm. uh, like. Leaf comes to mind, L E one F, uh and they're not like getting airtime, you know? Uh, yeah. or or they have like small communities, you know. But the the danger there, right, is like you could have this rapper who's super progressive and is with it and likes equality, and they'll have their super small rabid fan base, and the other people who need to hear that the most will never hear it. Cause right. They, that's what I'm saying. Like, like there needs to be someone that has that that is capable of getting the, the recognition that Kanye gets, right? But is is highly progressive and like I, I just I would like to say like I'm just sitting here being very curious about what would happen if like like let's say Kanye or someone else was just like suddenly like oh no it turns out I'm gay and like how would all these people react to like someone who is of that level uh, and just being like yeah. I'm gay. What are you going to do about it? I think, like, the closest thing we had to that was the Frank Ocean uh, saying that he's bisexual, <clears throat> mm-hmm. where people yeah. were like, oh, shit, like, I have had sex to his music a lot. And guys were feeling all types of weird about it. And then, like, everybody kind of forgot about it. Guys were like, yeah, Frank mm-hmm. Ocean's bisexual, but he's an artist and just kind of move on and be, yeah. like, be like, oh, wait a second. It's not weird to be bisexual. Uh, See, and, and then, like, I think because there's, there's a, a history of... Uh, of an anti-gay sentiment in uh, particularly in that more hardcore like gangster rap and whatnot. Mm, yeah. And I'm wondering what would happen if like someone like a Snoop Dogg or a Dr. Dr. Dre, Dre came out and was just like, yeah, gay's the way to, or like, like, it, like it kind of happened. It was, it was a comedic joke, but in the interview, uh, the movie with, um, uh, uh, Franco and, uh, uh, Seth Rogen there, uh, they were interviewing, Eminem, and he's like, "Oh yeah, no, oh, yeah, I'm gay. Yeah. I see I'm, that one. Like, I'm totally gay. Like, that, that's what all these songs are about—about about right. me being gay and whatnot. And like, if that was to happen in real life, I like, would love how that. would all the? Yeah, like, I, I'm wondering how would that <clears throat> change people who have been incredibly homophobic and are using uh, that culture to back up their yeah. homophobia? Yeah, I mean, like, or even just to like, if if Dr. Dre like co-signed a queer artist, you know? Yeah. Or, like, co-sign a transgender artist yes. and, like, sign them. Like, that would shift things pretty quickly. Yeah, things would change so dramatically. Yeah, people would just be like, oh, shit. Like, and that's really all it would take is one of those major cats or, like, if good music signed a queer artist. Like, that's really all it would take is people would be like, oh, shit, this music bumps. Because the music bumps, you know, like, it's out there. Yeah. It's happening. It's good. But until the people up there... And even at, like, local levels, you know, like, Hawaii, for instance, I'm sure that there's some, like, transgender rapper somewhere who just... We have a trans comedian who's doing really well. Like, she's getting a lot of attention, and she's doing really, really well. Right. But, and like... She's really good. She, she deserves a lot of it. But, like, in, in the hip-hop community, like, if, the sh- if most of the rappers are making, like, homophobic or transphobic remarks, like, in their songs, mm-hmm. like, 
is that transgender person ever going to go to a hip hop show? Or yeah, if they exactly. go, or if they go to one show and like the whole thing is like faggot, 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 like don't cut your dick off, blah 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 rhymes. Uh, then that person gonna be like, yo, this is fucking stupid, and leave and never come yeah, back. Yeah, and then and I, what, 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 what's worse with the, uh, what I find is the worst part about that scenario is the fact that like those people that are now being turned off by the scene, they could be creating things that change that scene forever. Yo, for they could be creating the song that like takes that thing global and whatnot and, and you, you they're c- now not a part of it anymore yeah. because of uh, of the the culture that's been there mm. what do you think cozy i think it'd be dope more people rap yeah and i think that like that's one if there is a thing that like i think the hip-hop community in hawaii needs it's like a safe space for pe- to people to do that experimentation we were talking about earlier mm. and to like fuck around but like a space that really will not tolerate bullshit. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, some of those, like, freestyle crews, like, had, like, very strict policies about that. You know, like, in California, like, they'd be like, you know, we keep it positive. Like, we don't degrade and stuff. And if you can't freestyle without degrading people, like, don't come here. You know, like, this isn't the place for you. If we had a place like that where people could, you know, just vibe and have... I mean, like, not not positive in a corny way Mm because i don't think that like positive music that doesn't hurt people doesn't i don't think it needs to be corny like i think we could talk all the shit we want about like gutting bankers you know i'm (laughs) I'm cool with that you know you know you know what i mean though but it's like it's finding like wait a second like we don't need to talk shit about micronesians or Mm -hmm. gay people like we should talk shit about people who do way worse things you know yeah uh and I think if we got to a space where we could come together to do that, that would be really powerful. Because then we'd be, like, building movements. And yeah. The question is, will we ever get to a point where we can stop infighting and take on the people who actually you know, are making our lives bad? You're a nihilist, so I don't think you think so, but I think so. I, I'm a very well, this thing is, person. I, I like to think so, but at the same time, it's like... How long have we known that, like, if we all united together and rose up against the power, if you will... How, like we've known that for decades now, and yet it still it's hasn't true. happened. Like, what what are the real chances that in the future, especially with the culture becoming what I see as becoming more and more anti intellectual, <clears throat> what are the chances that the future culture are going to see these things and be like, yeah, we need to like actually unite? That's actually one of the reasons why I'm so big on Bernie Sanders is because he's getting this huge following. He's getting he people has excited. That. Yeah, he has like like I've never been interested in voting. And listening to him sp- speak has made me go, you know what? I need to vote. Because if I don't, then there's absolutely... Like, if I don't and all these other people don't, there's absolutely no chance that uh, that the kind of change that he's talking about is going to occur. Right. And so like, it's motivated me, who's had zero interest in voting, because I've thought that it's been pretty pointless for the last several elections. Then I'm like, you know what? I actually went and registered to vote and to re- uh, registered as a Democrat so I can vote in our primary. Just because I was like, it needs every little push that it can. Yeah, that's. Why but I'm, I'm not like most people. That's why found, I'm going to go into politics. And I've I've found very much that I am not like most people. Like the like, it seems like every day something comes up that I'm like, oh wait, you don't feel this way? <laughs> oh, maybe I'm the weird one now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a weird position to be in where like, you know, you're insane. But at the same time, you're smart enough to know that insane people don't know they're insane. Mm. But there's a hashtag somewhere. Somewhere. That you can find. Something like that. So, uh, what do you got to plug? Where can people find you? Uh, Where can you find your music, your social? Sure. So, online, S-A-N-S Rhymes. Sans Rhymes is the handle on all of the major interweb media. So, Facebook.com slash Sans Rhymes. Uh, soundcloud.com slash sans rhymes and then sans rhymes dot uh, and yeah that's basically the way to find me um, I've got the music coming out Go Crazy should be available on iTunes probably at the point where this podcast comes out uh, so <clears throat> hopefully people can just buy it there if they want to check it out or- so, yeah, you can pop over to iTunes and, and download a Sterling's music sans you rhymes do that. yeah go crazy and the artist is just sans s-a-n-s cool I got some news. Greenleaf Tech. Go ahead. Um, we just got voted best podcast 2015 from Super CW. What? Which is kind of nice. interesting because I haven't uploaded a new episode for Greenleaf Tech in like six months. <laughs> so, 
but yeah, we got the best podcast. So. That's how that's how dope it is, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I got to get back on it. I got to get back on it. So yeah, look for a future mix. What are the qualifications for that? I have no idea. I like, didn't even we, know they had we, a podcast category. Like I, I know, I know, Krista. <laughs> and we need to talk to her and be like, "Hey, you need to get up on Aloha, bro, huh?" Yeah, <laughs> should invite her, man. I mean, fuck, we're part <clears throat> of you know, Greenleaf Checks, like the network. So, yeah, I guess. I mean, we're, they, they, we're, <clears throat> we're part of Greenleaf Checks Network. We're we're sister podcasts with the the Greenleaf Check podcast, and more podcasts yeah. to come this year. That's where I put like all my mixes. I have like other DJs mm-hmm. put up mixes and stuff too. I've, I've listened. I've I yeah. listened to like everything that came out of uh, Greenleaf Check and about the goods, all the associated things. Oh, I've, cool! I've, That's I've the song, and we appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because I, you know, like I see it, and I'm like, this is good <clears throat> stuff for Hawaii, not just hip hop, but like music and also like community. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I and that, up. that's the goal is to like create those spaces for people to be explorative. And you know, and to talk to each other, inspire, yeah, inspire, build a bridge talk between to... the generations as well, right? I've noticed it's getting increasingly harder to get the older cats to come on the podcast versus the younger cats like Sterling for some reason. But I'm gonna break down that wall. We will. <laughs> We're gonna get that talk out there. You just gotta have childcare available. <laughs> oh, that's while you yeah, do the podcast. Else, <laughs> if, if you had like babysitting, then some of the old cats I think will come. Mm, to that. What you been? What you got going on? We have comedy coming up. So uh, by the time this comes out, we'll have already missed the uh, the Jay Larson show. It went really well, though. Um, we were we were actually getting scared because the ticket sales were not very well, and so we were like uh, getting close to the curtain time, and we're like, "Are we going to be able to fill this room and like make it a good show?" And luckily enough, well, we had enough walk ups and uh, enough people uh, came out and whatnot, so that it ended up being quite good. Uh, other than that, coming up in February, on the 27th, we have Ben Bailey, who is from Cash Cab. He will be live at Hawaiian Brian's. You can get tickets to that at squadup.com. Uh, and then further down the line, uh, on April 16th, Cameron Esposito featuring Rhea Butcher, uh, also at Hawaiian Brian's. You can go to squadup.com to get that. And uh, keep listening and uh, follow the Aloha Broha on Facebook and follow me. Uh, science underscore Ben on Instagram. I'll be putting up uh, an announcement coming out for a March show uh, in the near future. So, yeah. Wouldn't, cool. it, wouldn't it be weird if Bill Murray showed up right now? Yes. <laughs> it would. It'd be weird but awesome. 